in, in the British government's own language, they described the murder of my father and that chapter as, as one of the darkest periods in their military history, worse than anything that's come out of Iraq and Afghanistan. And I think when you see their own internal analysis using language and discourse like that, I think it reminds us if we need reminding of just how serious the case is of my father, because what we've been saying for a very long time is that it doesn't represent one man. This isn't this isn't about the killing of one man. This is a system that was put in place that affected so many different people right across right across the the, the community and the divide. So in February 2019, the Supreme Court was unequivocal in ruling that all previous investigations hadn't met international human rights standards, hadn't met the Article 2 um, compliance element of the European Convention on Human Rights. And that was significant for a number of reasons. Uh, it, it effectively wiped the board clean with everything that the British government had tried to do over the previous 30 years. In those 30 years, we have had everything from um, local police investigations. We have had um, independent and in inverted commas police investigations. We've had um, judicial uh, review of the papers by former Sup Canadian Supreme Court jurist Peter Corey. We have had a barrister led review of the papers. And we've also we also became aware of internal government reviews, which we hadn't previously been aware of. But all of those were effectively declared null and void by the Supreme Court, the UK government's the, the highest court within that jurisdiction. And whilst the court didn't have the power to specifically order the government to initiate an inquiry, I think by a process of elimination that presented the British government with a significant problem as to what they could do. They have they have pretty much tried everything else and um, in their in their, um, I suppose, pursuit to resist a mechanism whereby the family would have involvement and there would be all the powers that one would associate with a credible legal vehicle to find out the truth uh, of something like this. So the, the, the judgment was in February. Um, we gave the government time to consider the judgment. Um, our lawyers got their head around that pretty quickly. Um, by July of that year, we grew frustrated at the government's inability to respond to their own Supreme Court judgment. And we initiated legal proceedings again, uh, reluctantly but necessarily, in Belfast to force the government to respond um, to the judgment. And we were told that it was too soon. It was a complicated judgment. They were considering it. They were having a review of the previous investigations, which seemed strange to me because why would you review, why would you review um, the investigations which the Supreme Court have been so um, unequivocal on. Uh, we felt that it was a stalling tactic and we continued with our, our, our legal challenge. At the start of this year, we met with um, the current British Secretary of State and since our um, Supreme Court victory in February 2019, we're now on to our third British Secretary of State. I've lost count as to how many Secretaries of State there have been since 1989, but this is the third one in a period of about 18, 20 months. So he brought us in for a meeting, which we felt was a little bit of a waste of time because he wanted to know what we wanted. Um, and I think that was borderline insulting because even a passing interest in our campaign, people would be very clear as to what it is we have wanted because the message has been consistent for 30, 31 years. And so since... since um, since that meeting, we then had we then had um, the pandemic, which obviously struck everywhere across the world. It started to get its grip here from March onwards, and the government said, "Look, we're dealing with the pandemic, and and you know really we need more time." And that's what they were saying to the court in Belfast. Um, a couple of weeks ago, the the, the case came to hear. And, uh, in the face of much resistance from the British government because they were complaining that they needed more time. And they also did not want to disclose a document showing their own timetable as to what they'd been doing since the uh, since the judgment in February 19. The judge had a look at it and was, again, very clear that that needed to be disclosed to us. And what that document showed was that all work in response to the Supreme Court judgment halted in July 2019. So they have effectively sat on their hands since that period doing absolutely nothing. It, it, it shouldn't come as a shock, but I, I think the judge in the High Court in Belfast put it very well that this is insult added upon injury. Uh, the injury obviously being the collusion that the British government accept, but the insult uh, which compounds the injury is the fact that the British government have effectively treated us with contempt in the way in which they've delayed responding to the Supreme Court. So the judge was uh, absolutely scathing. That was on a Friday. On the Monday, um, over the course of the weekend, the British government's council 
uh, made contact with ours saying that they were conceding um, on Monday, they wouldn't be resisting, they would apologise for the delay and they would set out the timetable by which they would respond. So that was the context in which we got the date of November 30th. And the, the, the November 30th is what the, is the date that the British government have committed to responding to us as a family in the context of the Supreme Court judgment. Now, we are in no way naive to the type of British government that we're dealing with here. And I don't say that lightly or flippantly, that this particular British government has set itself very square in the face of human rights. Um, it has recently passed legislation. It's now in the House of Lords where it will legalise the use of agents. Effectively, they describe them as covert human intelligence sources, but they will legalise uh, and um, provide immunity without any judicial or public oversight to any crimes that agents can commit, which is a departure from the, the model, as I understand that the FBI have in America and certainly Canadian um, legislation would, would, would similarly would make sure that uh, crimes such as rape, as torture, as kidnapping, as murder would would never attract uh, immunity. But the British government are set set for that. They also have a fairly poor record with regards to legacy. Uh, anybody with a passing interest in legacy will know that it is it is still as divisive an issue uh, as it can possibly be in this society, and it's very difficult to get uh, a uniform approach on anything. This British government has united the victim sector and the legacy sector um, without question in the fact that there is uniform disagreement in the way that they are approaching the legacy. So I say all that not to be not to be necessarily pessimistic, but more realistic with the type of government that we are dealing with here. But the difficulty remains is that they have a Supreme Court judgment um, which they must respond to, and they must respond to it in a way which is Article 2 compliant. So that's why we have, since the court, um, since the court pressure forced them into setting this November 30th date, we have been canvassing as much support as, as we can. I, I think that for me, over the course of our 31 year campaign, where we have seen the most effective pressure resulting in progress for us comes from two main areas and it comes from the Irish government and it comes from America. Um, we were, I've said this before, I think, in, in meetings with yourselves, that we would not be where we are as a campaign without the support of the Bretons, without the support of the American legal fraternity uh, and the consistent pressure that Jews have then applied onto your own uh, elected representatives. Our, our analysis is that whilst the Secretary of State um, was the respondent in the judicial proceedings, this decision will be taken from number 10 Downing Street. And it's important, we feel, that the Taoiseach makes a direct intervention with Boris Johnson to reiterate his government's um, position on this and making it very clear that, that there's only one, one option, really, that the British government need to consider, and that's an inquiry which they have resisted for so long. Obviously, the political landscape in, in America is changing. It's in a period of transition, as, as we all know. Um, I, I think having somebody like Biden coming in, who has a very strong track record, not just with regards to um, human rights in Ireland and the, supporting the Good Friday Agreement, but he, he has history and traction with our own campaign, certainly when he was a senator and on the Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, he had supported the bipartisan motion which worked its way through both houses of Congress, which originally started its life as an all-party motion in the Dáil. So we are um, doing what we can, um, and I suppose I'm, I'm asking this room if they have any ideas as to how we can do this also, then, then please utilise that.